Does any client, agent or picture editor really care what camera you use? Now, bear with us. We're going to share our experience a bit more. Uh, I think you might be surprised at how it all ended up and, uh, and what we've actually learned along the way. Okay, so maybe the title should have read, really. How important is the calibre of your camera for commercial fee-paying jobs in today's content creating world and thinking ahead to the longevity of the kit going forward? Yeah, catchy. We would mm. have never have got that on the thumbnail. But seriously, this is a question that I've asked many agents and photographers and clients over the years. Um, and especially in my early days, uh, it's been 33 years and counting that my sole income has been as a photographer. Now, in the late 80s and the early 90s, the answer to that question was clearly yes, it did matter. And as a commercial photographer, you needed to shoot medium or large format. The reality was there were only three options, Hasselblad, Mamiya and Bronica. Now, of course, there were others like Rolleiflex, which were beautiful. Yeah. Uh, they were very scarce, they were relatively expensive. And in my experience, they were very temperamental and not easy to get repaired. Contacts uh, also did a lovely 645 and Fuji was also on the scene, but not really mainstream as say on Hasselblad or Mamiya. So even 6x45 was frowned upon when I started in 89. So a 6x6, or as it was called, two and a quarter square, was the accepted minimum. Now ironically, when that was cropped and used as an A4 cover, the actual image was the same as 6x45. Mm. Now, don't get me wrong, I mean, I owned a Nikon FM2, loved it, Nikon F5, beautiful. But these were primarily for press and sports gigs, um, or lower, lower budget commercial photography jobs. I owned a Hasselblad 500 from the Jealous. 90s or so, which was beautiful for still life and portraits and print. Um, but it wasn't for commercial work, it was more for exhibitions and prints and uh, yeah, sheer love of it, really. <laughs> So my first commercial photography job was as an in-house architectural and interiors photographer in 1989, working for an architect's firm in London. Now we hired a Hasselblad and a few lenses, but when I struck out on my own in 1993, money was an issue for a newly mortgaged 24 year old. So I ended up buying a Bronica SQA and three lenses. It was the poor man's Hasselblad. Mm. Uh, still two and a quarter square transparencies. So the Bronica was a bit plasticky in comparison to the Swedish counterpart, but the lenses were near perfect. I mean, almost, almost too clinical. Okay. But these days, sharpness isn't everything. No. <laughs> uh, companies like Leica and Sire seem to balance the sharpness and uh, character together somehow. Uh, that's another that video. That is a whole other video. So five years of shooting and a whole lot of architecture and I soon came to a crossroads in the mid-90s when one large construction client wanted me to shoot everything for them on 5x4 transparency, uh, or slide film as it was known. So I needed something a bit more compact than a Sign RP2, which was the big studio camera of the day. Mm. So I bought this, a Wister 5x4 field camera in Cherrywood with a Nikon 90mm lens. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's brass and it's wood and uh, leather and an utter, utter <laughs> to use. The background was dark, the screen was dark, the, I had to focus with the loop. I even had to have this blanket on my head. As you can probably tell, I hated shooting with it, but really, I had no choice. It took me 10 years to master it. But just so there's no misunderstanding, I would never give up my Fuji GFX100 for it. Not yeah. happening. Okay. <laughs> now, savvy photographers at this time were using digital backs on their existing kit. So Phase One, Leaf, Kodak and Imacon. Um, many of these companies later merged. Hasselblad bought Imacon, Phase One now owns Leaf Digital. Um, and as for Kodak, that's another oh, video. Really? What were they thinking? <laughs> At the other end of the spectrum, Nikon and Canon were doing their thing. Nikon announced the D1, followed quite quickly by the D1H and D1X. Canon, Fuji and Kodak all had smaller format contenders um, out roughly about the same sort of timeline. So after testing a few cameras, we settled on a Nikon D1X, which was a 5.47 megapixel camera. 
with a, and a DX size sensor as well. And it actually, it was very, very good. I mean, it matched the quality of 35 millimeter scan. So it was a good starting point for press and sport and some commercial work, but it didn't come close to medium format film. But many clients didn't seem to care about the downgrading quality over the advantage of cost savings and they jumped the gun, simply wanted to save money uh, on their printed work. So at the time, Claire, my then business partner and I were sharing the Nikon on alternate days and we very quickly realized we needed another camera. So I ended up buying a, a Kodak DCS 760, which had a six megapixel sensor, slightly bigger sensor, wonderful at ISO 80, but totally unusable from 200 ISO onwards. And not only that, it cost me seven and a half thousand pounds just for the body in 2001, which in today's money is a whopping 13,474 quid and 76p. Now it wasn't until Nikon's D2X camera came out that I saw a clear difference in the quality of files. It's 12 megapixel sensor, still DX format, was a definite upgrade. Now unfortunately, none of the top four digital backs would fit Bronica, and to this day, I don't know if any ever did. So the writing was on the wall for the Bronica, and I sold my kit shortly after the D2X was released. And now we had two D2Xs and were totally digital. But the first real milestone in this story is the third generation the Nikon D3 and D3X. I owned both. One 12 megapixel low light champion and the other 24 megapixel full frame, almost the holy grail. We shot images with the D3X from concept work through to 48 sheet posters for Mitre Sportswear, for Ford Design Europe, for Ford Motorsport. And I remember turning up at the motor show and staring at this massive wall poster of the Ford Transit custom van hoping that it didn't look pixelated. Lucky for me, thank you very much, Nikon. It didn't, and Ford and Mitre used our images everywhere, and, and big, the Mitre conference was just wall-to-wall -wall images. At this point in the early noughties, commercial clients had accepted full frame as the standard. Ooh, it was really only high-end fashion that seemed to be dragging their heels a bit, maybe top-end photographers not wanting to make the change from analog to digital. Mm but it was inevitable. And soon Nikon D4s, Canon D1s, and 5Ds were the staple of every photographer's bag. In some ways, I did miss shooting with the Bronica, and dare I say, even the Wister. I was treated with curiosity, even respect with these large cameras, especially the Wister. But now, now I look like a press and paparazzi photographer, and they really, really didn't no, have no, a no, good no. reputation at the time. Deserving. The real milestone of modern camera design came with the evolution of mirrorless which wasn't that long ago, relatively speaking. Um, sensor technology was also moving fast. And on the surface, um, manufacturers at the beginning were just taking the mirror box out, but it was much more than that. Um, for years, we had the legacy of 35 millimeter format, but by now, Micro Four Thirds had come along and was built from the ground up to be purely digital. So F Fuji's innovative X-Trans sensor design narrowed the gap in perceived quality compared to full frame. So unfortunately for me and many others, Nikon was late to the party. I was using a D4S by now and a D810 uh, with a lot of Zeiss and Leica lenses, uh, eking out the most I could from these cameras and sensors. The quality was amazing uh, and I found it difficult though to use my manual primes and really wanted focus peaking. Yeah, I know, I wanted it all. So let's jump ahead to 2016 and Nikon had, well, nothing it seemed in the pipeline. So I bought myself a Fujifilm X-T2 Titanium. For me, not for work, I shot a comparison with the 16 megapixel D4 and what I lost in low light, I gained in resolution. So in reality, it was on a par and above 400 ISO, it was far better than my Nikon D3X, which had the same resolution and that was the benchmark due to what I had achieved with it. How could a camera this small, and dare I say cheap, uh, be up there with the image quality of one of the best professional DSLRs on the market and a smaller DX sensor as well? So in 2017, I took the Fuji to Iceland to shoot book covers 
and I was blown away by the image quality and the portability. My old Nikon kit weighed in at 12 kilos the year before, but the Fuji kit with the same lenses was just five kilos. It was late 2019 and I had a meeting with a creative director followed directly with a meeting with an agent. A third of my portfolio was now shot on the Fuji and they both gravitated to those images. So I asked the same question to both of them, the one I had been asking for decades. Do you care what camera I use? No, was the answer. It's all about the image. It's about the artistic, your artistic voice. It's about what the mm -hmm. picture evokes, the emotion your client wants to evoke. So this is the first time in nearly three decades, finally, no one cared. In the 80s and 90s, you were judged on your equipment as much as your images. But now in 2024, professional cameras have reached a point where they're, it's no longer an issue. A few years ago, as we, uh, we, sh we shot Fred Syriax for a business magazine and Chris used the Fuji, the new Fuji, it was definitely a talking point between them. Um, and because Fred was an upcoming household name and was very busy, he'd been photographed countless times before with Hasselblad and Phase Ones and here was this guy from Essex shooting <laughs> him on a camera that looked like a Pentax ME Super from 1983 but he ended up using one of our shots on his profile picture in his website and the A3 spreads uh, from the magazine looked amazing. So whatever your niche, portrait, street, landscape, student or professional, Cartier Bresson was quoted as saying, find a camera you like and learn to use it instinctively, then forget about it, it's not important, the image is everything. He also was quoted as saying that sharpness is a bourgeois concept, which I'm sure I've used a few times over the years in client meetings. Anyway, look, we hope you have enjoyed uh, this little flashback in time. Uh, we are busy sorting dates to do more interviews. So please, if you enjoyed the channel, like and subscribe and hit the notification, notification bell, then you'll be the first to see the new content. See you next time. See you next time.